and we are recording. Yeah, I would like to uh, call a finance committee meeting of December 6, 2022 to order at 3.05 p.m. And thanking uh, everybody for being here, including those of us in the council who were uh, up until 12.30 or 1 o'clock after getting home from our usual short brief meeting. And uh, I'm going to start by the usual announcement that pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 is extended. This meeting will be conducted by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Um, no in-person attendance um, of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. And I also want to remind anybody who's um, involved with the meeting in any manner that this meeting is being recorded. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, go through the members of the committee um, just to make sure that everybody can uh, hear me and be heard. Um, so uh, Lynn? Yes. Bob? I'm here. Matt? Present. Okay, uh, Bernie. Present. Michelle. Present. Kathy. Yes, here. And I think Alicia is the only one who uh, is not here. Uh, we should keep an eye out for um, to see if she comes in um, accidentally through the attendees uh, list. Uh, I don't see her now. No. Uh, I'll check. Okay. And I see that Anna's here. Uh, and uh, she will, uh, you know, we can bring her into the meeting uh, later. Actually, kind of, I want to just, um, we, we have a little bit of a problem because we may have more counselors than can attend without creating a um, difficulty with the open meeting law requirement that we not have a quorum present. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, since the first agenda item that's going to be a, 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 a actual discussion item is on the sewer regulations uh, and uh, the financial implications of the sewer regulations, uh, Hanno is really involved and extremely important to the discussion at the TSO committee of the regulation and is very familiar with the regulation. And uh, if she would like to be brought into the room when we're having that discussion, then I invite Anna to raise her hand and then I'll know. Uh, but in any event, um, what we're Planning. Alicia's also in the audience now. Okay, then she should be brought in definitely right now. God. So while we're dealing with that, let's see. Alicia, hi. Can you just confirm that you can hear us? Yes, thank you, Andy. Okay. Um, so uh, we really haven't started other than just the introductory part. And I was going to just uh, on the reviewing of the agenda, um, what I um, am planning to do if it uh, is uh, in listeners objection from the committee is to turn the order around a little bit. And after uh, inviting public comment, to do the sewer regulations before the budget uh, guidelines in order to um, limit the amount of time that uh, Guilford Borg and Amy Rusecki have to be with us. And uh, so uh, we would then proceed to do the, uh, go back to the guidelines discussion, 
and get as far as we can there and to do the um, residential property transfer uh, uh, fee or tax, whatever we're going to call it, uh, is the third item. So that would be the order. And if that's, uh, if there's no objection to that, then I'm going to turn to uh, members of the public and um, see if there's any member of the public who would like to offer um, a comment on any issue that uh, pertains to the Finance Committee, including, but not exclusively, um, items that are on the agenda. Um, they should raise their hand and we'll bring them into the room so they can make comment, uh, their comments. So seeing no hands raised, then uh, last, last time, Anna, if you want to be brought into the room for this discussion. Okay, please bring Anna in for this discussion. And so just, just to clarify, we're not starting with water and sewer, Andy. Yes, we are starting with water and sewer. As I said a moment ago, Anna is extremely involved okay. and is gotcha. extremely familiar with the regulations. And uh, so uh, she was the key person in TSO that brought us uh, through the process. And she's well aware of yep. issue, which um, we're going to be talking about, which is uh, the portion of the proposed regulation that would um, change the uh, responsibility for problems with sewer lines that are between property lines in the sewer main from the homeowner or property owner to the um, enterprise fund. And uh, so uh, in, it has implications for uh, the rates. So uh, those are the two things. Alicia, you had your hand up, so I wanted to. Yes, thank you, Andy. Uh, so I don't have any, um, like, I'm okay with the rearranging of the agenda. I'm just wondering, so like, I'm currently at work, and I just take an hour to come to the meeting for topics that I would like to discuss, and I wanted to talk about the budget guidelines. And so I'm wondering if it's okay that I leave for a little bit and come back when that discussion starts because I can only stay for one hour of time on this meeting. Uh, that's fine if that works for you. If it doesn't work for you, then we'll switch the order back. But if it's uh, otherwise, uh, do you want us to go on somebody I can, to text you? I can, te I can text Alicia when we're ready. Yeah, that would work. I don't need the order to be switched because I'm, I'm sort of flexible in that I can take the first hour or the second hour. Um, so that's okay. Um, yeah, it would be helpful if somebody could just text me when we're going to switch back to. Um, okay, Kathy has your uh, cell number apparently, so she's going to yeah. text you when we get to the end of the uh, sewer regulations, and uh, then you'll know. Thank you for being so flexible. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, Sean, um, are you going yeah. to introduce this or are we going to have Guilford or Amy introduce this? I'll give a quick introduction and then turn it over to, I think, um, Amy. All right, Amy, are you going to make the presentation? Okay. Um, so you reviewed water regulations already. Um, we're bringing back sewer regulations, which you haven't discussed in detail. Um, and you'll see that from the presentation, some of the impacts. Um, I think one of the things that Amy and Guilford, Paul and I have spoken about is that we really want to emphasize the financial impacts of the changes in the regulations. Um, I think in the prior meeting, we focused a lot on sort of the content of the regulations, but didn't um, get didn't get into the the impacts on ratepayers and how significant these changes are for, for ratepayers. Um, so you'll see some of that information in the presentation, but essentially what it results in is a you know 10% increase in the rates just for the impacts of the regulations, plus whatever regular percentage increase we would have um, in a given year. And so we just want to make sure that the finance committee, when you, you know, provide feedback to the council, or if you provide to another committee, um, sort of the, the gravity and the magnitude of the, the impact on rates is communicated. Because I think there's been a lot of conversation about the, the changes and sort of individually what they mean, but I'm not sure we've kind of taken the step back 
um, and looked at what it means as a whole. And because we're starting to work on rates for next year, we're starting to model what those impacts are. And it's pretty significant because you know, we're, we already have a centennial project, which, gonna, which, which is going to push rates up as we ramp up the funding for that project. On the sewer side, we have a gravity belt project um, and some other uh, infrastructure projects, which are pushing rates up. Um, and so when you add this layer, this on top of it, it does call, it is going to result in some pretty, at least for one year, you know, a very significant increase that might be difficult for some people to absorb and it's gonna require a lot of communication so that people understand, um, at least with this part of the increase in the rate, that they are sort of getting a benefit in some ways or they're getting something for this increase. You know, they're get, getting some protection um, by paying more, they're sort of spreading the risk out, um, but it does mean everyone's gonna pay more for that sort of distribution of risk. So I will hand it off to Amy and unless Lynn, you wanna ask a question first. Just as we're going through that, I think we should keep this in mind in terms of um, timing in relationship to the school override vote and also um, any other increase that might come should we move forward on curbside pickup, uh, recycling, and composting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Bye. All right. So, Amy, do you want to go ahead and um, do you have share screen ability? I, it looks like I do. So, okay. hi. Good to see all of you guys. and. You guys are okay. I'm gonna. Oh no, host disabled screen. All right, share. let me let me. I think I can give it to you. Okay. Um, All right. Why don't and, you and, try it? Try it now. Oh, I can. Awesome. Um, cool. So I'm just gonna walk through. I I apologize that we've talked about this to so many different committees. So some of this might be information that you guys know or don't know. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to try and go through this as quickly as possible. But, you know, obviously you guys know that we're talking about sewer use regulations um, and they're important. There's kind of three big things that they're doing. And the first thing is just ensuring that all the materials and construction standards and everything, as people connect to the public sewer system, make sure that they're all meeting the same standards. And so that's not only people's sewer service lines, that's also private sewer systems. So like it, if a development, if you know a developer builds a development and they want to connect into the system, making sure that there's a um, consistent standard. Um, it also defines this, uh, the federal and state discharge requirements, which really impacts the user in terms of, it says what you can and can't put down the drain because ultimately we're gonna take that and discharge that to the environment. Um, and so that's things like fat soils and greases, um, you know, you can't pour a bunch of chemicals down the drain um, and then solids such as flushable wipes, dental floss, stuff like that. Um, and then industrial discharges, which right now we don't have anything that qualifies in town as an industrial discharge, but there's a placeholder for if that ever happens in the future. Um, and then the last part of the, the major part of these is um, the ownership responsibility and resolution process. And um, that's where we're making a major shift in terms of um, service line ownership and responsibility. So previously, um, owners would own the entire length of their service line, and the town was only responsible for um, the main the main sewer line, so the larger diameter um, network of collection systems, but not the individual line that goes to your house, your business, the apartment that you live in. Um, and what's proposed in these regulations is for the town to own the service line anytime it's within the town property, and the owner is going to own it any time that it's not on the town property, which means some most of the time it's just on the owner's property. But every once in a while, because um, as Anna will tell you, um, sewers run by gravity. <laughs> so sometimes in order to get the gravity down to the main line, you're going to be cutting through your neighbor's yard um, or cutting through, you know, some other parcel of land to get to the sewer line. Um, and so the owner would own it basically until it goes onto the town right of way. Um, there are, because everything runs by gravity in the sewer system, you know, there's a little carve out there for easements where the easements that we have to run our um, major lines that might go through someone's backyard, um, we, that easement only allows us to maintain the sewer, the larger diameter sewer main. And so in that case, the owner would continue to own, um, to, to own and be responsible for the sewer line, their sewer service all the way to the main line. Um, and this is consistent with a lot of other towns that have 
the ownership model that we're looking at, this is how they slice and dice the easements. Um, and what this will trigger, because there's going to be different ownership on different portions of the line, the sewer service line, um, what this triggers is the need for us to have cleanouts, which is basically an access portal that would be at the change in ownership location so that both parties can access their portion of the sewer line to do any maintenance, to do any cleaning, any flushing, anything like that. Um, and so, you know, we would require this at the property line, um, understanding that we're not going to force all, every single house in town to install this immediately. This is going to be something that anytime there's new construction or co uh, connections or when there's um, sewer service line work being done, that we will have them come into compliance with this requirement. Um, so that's going to be a slow trickle process. So that's what's being proposed in terms of the ownership change. Um, we, we have looked at, over the last, I think, three years, we've looked at all of the permits that were pulled um, for people to do sewer service improvements or repairs. Um, and so we were able to pull out the cost from that and it averages about uh, $7,300 per repair. Um, and we're estimating that we probably need about 100 to 200, we would have to do about 100 to 200 of these per year. Um, and partly it's because anytime we would be doing a road construction, if we're responsible for that sewer service line, we're gonna make sure that the portion that's underneath that road is gonna be um, repaired and brought up to brought up to the, the standard um, and in good shape. Um, and then there's gonna be the breaks that happen over time. There's gonna be a lot of different things that trigger this. Um, so you, you do the 100 to 200 service lines times the cost of per repair. Um, and you're looking at some pretty hefty numbers in the sewer budget. Um, and I hope it's fair to say, I know when Sean and Paul and Guilford and I were talking about our budget for this year, um, we were proposing, you know, much as we need more than the $500,000, we were proposing that at least for year one of this to soften the blow a little bit, but also get towards what we needed. Um, we were proposing that we put $500,000 in the budget um, in year one to start. Um, to start covering the cost of what we would be responsible for. Um, and so ultimately, um, you know, like, like Sean said, he's modeled that out. And ultimately, it's going to impact the rates by about 55 cents per 100 cubic feet. Um, I use that to just pull a couple of numbers. We know that the average Amherst user uses about 92 uh, 100 cubic feet per year. So you can see what their impact is on their annual bill. Um, and a, a conservative Amherst user is about 57 hundred cubic feet per year. So again, you can see, depending on, you know, what your water usage history is, you can see how this might impact you in the long run. Uh, so I can pause it here. We've got additional slides that just kind of show some of this backup information, but I think hopefully this is enough for you guys to kind of discuss. Okay. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. I'm a little confused, Amy, about where the ownership switches from the the, the homeowner to the town, because there's the, the street and then there's a, a right of way that's between the street and property. Well, the property line goes to the street, but you have a town right of way uh, that's 10 feet or something like that. So where is the exact point where the homeowner responsibility versus the town uh, ends is it at the curb, if you will, or is it? it it's at the right of way uh, line, which means basically you own. I mean, in simple terms, you own what's on your property. We own what's on our property. Right. It just gets a little complicated where sometimes your sewer line might go over your under your neighbor's property, and you're still going to own that like you do now. But once it goes onto town property, town owns it. Okay, so it's at the it's at the right of way boundary. It's right? at the right of way boundary. Okay. Yeah, which is wider than the roadside, but different widths at different places in town. Got it. Got it. Okay, and then the the you know you you talked about funding you know the repairs. Have you looked at insurance rather than funding to see whether we could insure these lines for less money annually than we'd have to pay? I'm, I might kick that to, I know, 
you know, Paul yeah, and so, maybe so, Lynn did some research on that. <laughs> and I think we looked at the model where we didn't take ownership and private homeowners could have the option to get insurance. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking for the town to buy insurance. So the, the town the town could do that as well. We could purchase insurance for each each individual household. Um, there is there are companies out there that provide that insurance. I forget exactly what the cost is. I could pull that up. Um, and we did we did get quotes on that. So I think that might be an option as well. Paul, maybe maybe they spoke about this. I think the, the one difference here might be you know insurance is usually insure against some sort of accident or breakage or something like that happening. It sounds like from Amy's description, there's going to be some proactive replacement, even if, you know, work done to these, that's going to require money. When we do roads, we do a certain number of roads every year. And so there's going to be proactive costs that I don't think insurance would cover that because again, it's usually you're insured against some sort of accident or something happening. Um, so there may be some insurance, but it's not going to take all the cost um, of what was described. I also, I, I heard Bob's question as to whether or not the town Right. should take out insurance right. for our portion i didn't i mean what yeah, paul, yeah and I, I agree what paul investigated was what would it cost a homeowner to take out insurance for their portion i, I just threw it out there it just might be cheaper than paying for it out of pocket so to speak I'm trying to find Paul. I thought we did talk about the possibility and I'm I'm trying to find the email, Bob. I'm sorry. I, did, I don't have it up fast enough, but I think we did look into that and it still was not um, TSO still opted for this uh, direction, but I'm going to, I'll, I'll try to look for that. I mean, it might be more expensive. That's fine. You know, I just thought we should, you know, have that information if it's available. My recollection is TSO was talking about the part that Amy described as to where the delineation was, uh, I don't think we talked about the question of insurance that I recall. Guilford, did you have anything? Um, just one other clarification on the prop who owns what. There's right-of-ways and there's also easements. There's a lot more sewer easements because sewer flows by gravity. So there's a lot of people, especially downtown, who goes out the back of their house. There's easements back there. There's some there are some other not easements. So it would either go to the road layout line or to a sewer easement line, not just to your property line. And that's defined in the proposed reg. I assume. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have one more general question. Could you please put in the packet uh, the proposed change that we're talking about in terms of financial impact? I know there was a TSO report. I just didn't see it in the finance package, so it'd be easier just to have it. So on the on what was just priced out, um, this the current what we currently do is if anything happens on your property, it's your problem. If anything happens anywhere within your sewer line, your sewer service line. So that includes when it's under the town roadway before it connects to the main line, that's, you know, that's your service and that's your responsibility. That's the current model for both water and sewer. So it's the sewer line under the road and then from the road onto your house. The change that's being proposed is the road, the sewer line under the road and up to- Yeah, the sewer line under the road would be the town's responsibility, not the homeowner's responsibility. And the homeowner would still be responsible for wherever that line is back to their house. Is that correct? Yeah, and once it's on their property. And then if they're responsible, including if um, they didn't have the clean out access that we're now putting in a standard so you're going to be actually upgrading but would you would you only upgrade as if the rest of the line is being disturbed yeah the way we're in some way they're building something new they're putting a new you're you're tearing up the road and running a new line so there wouldn't be 
I'm in, I don't get sewer. We're, we're beyond yeah. sewer. We're, we're, we're on septic. But so, so it's the, it's that, and that is what is 730 to 1.5 million, 1.5 um, in costs based on how many properties you think a year have something happen to their sewer line from their home to their street, correct? From the street, from the street line to, yeah. Yeah, so to, to the middle of the road, yeah. Okay. It's, it's also based on what we think we'll have to replace when we're doing any other type of road, road work. So that there's the number of people who have problems, but if we're tearing the road up and we know there's a bad sewer line there, we're gonna replace the sewer line before we pave it because we don't wanna cut the pavement again. Right. So it's it's some of it is because a problem occurred and some of it is because you're doing preventive maintenance by by upgrading. So I think we're going to have to make those parts clear. And then what Sean started out with saying, it's hard for me to think of thirty one to fifty dollars a year without a context of what's happening to the rates if we didn't make a change. Um, and the so maybe when we come back to this next, Sean, just a simple over the next five years, I, I realize we're in the super guesstimate range, but some of it is we've got the built-in other costs. So I don't know whether, I know everyone's been facing pretty substantial rate increases anyway. Um, and then this is on top of them. So it's, it's not just the one year increase, but it's then from ever more, your rate is now at the higher level. So, um, so yeah, Andy, can you know, I $30, $30 uh, a year doesn't sound bad. It's yeah. just between the yeah. water and sewer, I need to be able to see them both. Yeah. Right. So, so that $50 increase will be both on sewer and water. So think about those as combined. It's going to be in that $100 range um, when you do both. And it'll be a big bump up in the first year. And then we'll have that first year to sort of evaluate, you know, are we at the right level? Do we need to tick it up again? You know, I think that's one of the reasons why we're being a little careful on how much we increase it because we want to get that actual data to see what plays out. Um, but it could tick up again the second year if we if it turns out our numbers low and we need to get closer to the to the numbers that Amy provided, it could be another bump up the next year. But once we get to the right level, then it'll sort of balance out. Um, but yeah, it could be a couple of years of steeper increases to factor this in. So just, and, and we can provide that data. We can provide the what it would be with and without. Okay, so did you just say, we're just looking at sewer, there's another $50 that's water? Yeah, so the water, which was already discussed, is gonna have the same, um, sort of the same, a little bit different, but a similar impact of uh, assuming more cost than we currently have. Uh, by by adopting the regulations as currently written, and and the water line is this is exactly this mirror image of this that you know, town is responsible for up to your property line, then on into up into your house it's you. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, that is the discussion that we had. When we talked about the water regs, if you recall, and uh, Amy at that point made a similar presentation uh, where. Um, it helped us to determine how much uh, was being paid by homeowners who were complaining when they had to pay for repairs under the street, the cost of transferring that to the town and the effect it would have on rates. So it's really the same thing. And we all have to remember that uh, we had several council meetings where we had very vocal um, but, unhappiness on no, papers prepared. I did, Andy. I did remember it, but I'm just trying to say, you know, I'm, the memo on the financing to me is you get an impact here, you get an impact here, and this is what would have happened in general. And then I add it all up. I can't pull them into to little boxes. We talked about something a couple a month or so ago, and here's another piece of it because I think, yeah. So. I'll stop. Those yeah. are my questions. Just um, you know, it's a good point, and uh, it's obvious uh, um, that when we enact both regulations, uh, those of us who are on sewer, we get one bill, so it'll show up at one time, not two times. <laughs> Bernie. Yeah, just to be 
real concrete, and then I have a question. And the the the, the, the being real concrete is a, in front of my house. There's a curb about 12 feet away from the curb going towards my house. There is a property bound. So this would that this would encompass that the town would be responsible from for everything between the curb and where the property bound is. Is that correct? If if that's what the layout is at your house. Is yeah. that, okay, fine. The, the 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 other thing that's sort of obvious here is is that if we're going to put a surcharge on for this um, particular set of repairs, is there a plan to have a separate account for this? So the money segregated out and people won't uh, uh, be suspicious that this is somehow using to pay for other things. So we're not currently treating it as a surcharge. We haven't discussed that. We're just showing it as an increase in the rate. Um, but we, but we will report annually sort of the income and expenses to see if we had the right estimate. Um, there will be an expense line budgeted for this, so we'll be able to see if if we spent those um, spent the the funds that we allocated for this, or if we came in under or came in higher. So we will track it to see how we do um, okay. in terms they'll, of our estimates. They'll be reporting, but there'll be no um, separate yeah, line. Item. Currently, we're not we're not approaching it as a surcharge. Could 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 you? I just want to. But could you earmark those monies flowing in? It, even if yeah. it was a, a, a phantom account, the way, way Bernie's talking about it, so that people don't think it just went into the cent centennial cost more than we expected it to, the three other things that are bumping up our rates. Yeah, I'll I'll take a look with um with Sonia at our chart of account structure and um and try to think about you know if we yeah, I, it, it's all on the rate, so it's all going to come yeah. in in a similar fashion. It's not like um you know like sewer entrances where there's sort of a separate bill that they pay um but there there may be ways to back into the number just knowing how many cubic feet we sold somebody and taking 50 cents times that number we'll know how much was for this um was for this yeah i, I think it would you know because we're we're gonna um you know be some some folks who uh another hundred dollars a year is, is you know we'll, they'll shrug for other people this will be a, a significant impact mm -hmm. and um I think having some way to demonstrate that the money's been allocated or segregated or, or targeted for just this particular uh, type of repair, uh, it's a pain, I know, but I, I think it gives people some assurance. Yeah, I mean, while we have Gilford and Amy, I'll just pose a question to them. I think they, they'll know off the top of their head. Will, will you be able to segregate the costs of these types of repairs from your other um, sewer water infrastructure projects? It's going to be difficult. Um, we we would have to set it up to start that way, and then we'd have a method for doing it. Otherwise, it would just for paving this road, and we have five sewer lines. It would just be in the sewer lines. But um, as long as we, I guess, as long as we set it up as we go along, we should be able to keep track. Okay. Luke. Yeah, I want to go back to my original comment about staging this with regard to tax increases and um, based on the elementary school and also the um, um, issue of the, of the potential of adding to um, our going into hauler contracts for this town. And just say that I think we need to be thinking now about the public relations aspect of this. I think we need to um, make sure people understand what they're getting and what they're not getting and what uh, insurance they have the option of getting and what that insurance would cover or not. That's just kind of a public service. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we take all of that into consideration as we move forward. And I'm I do want to, I guess, request or ask that when we receive sewer rates and water rates in the future, that we get comparables to other cities and towns that are have policies that are similar, uh, because otherwise it's apples and oranges and it doesn't mean anything. So, okay. okay uh, Michelle. 
I have a bit of maybe an unpopular question um, and a little bit biased too. Um, I'm like Kathy uh, on septic. Um, and I'm just wondering if in terms of what we're talking about here, if the town has any plans to deal with the remaining folks who are on septic, um, given that we're talking about, you know, uh, providing additional services to folks um, in the community, but there are still some of us that are on septic. Um, I'll let uh, Guilford come back to that in a second. Of course, uh, what we all recognize is those of us who are on sewer pay for a sewer fee in addition to our water fee that's um, separately listed on our bills and people who don't have um, who are on septic don't have that second charge and uh, but there are reasons why people who are on septic might prefer to have be on sewer so Guilford do you have a response we do have a, a plan for how we would possibly sewer the rest of the community um, we haven't updated it. We updated it maybe 10 years ago, but we haven't updated it since then. Um, so we do have rough prices. If the sewer commissioners or a group of people were to come to the sewer commissioners and ask, we have that information. And then um, it would be up to the, you have to appropriate money for it. So it would come down back to the sewer commissioners slash council to appropriate the money for the project. So that's how the these projects would move forward. And, Thank you. Know, you. I appreciate that. I, I didn't even know how many folks were still on sewer and I don't mind my sewer so much, um, but I just was curious given that we're talking these big numbers and thank you. Uh, Paul? Yeah, the way most communities do it is that if you extend the sewer line, whoever is be benefiting from the extension pays a betterment tax. So the people who are benefiting from it pay the, the infrastructure cost in addition to being, you know, having the um, opportunity to put your sewage into the sewer line. So, so if it benefits your property, it's assumed that you'll pay for that extension. So that's we not, that's not how town that here. Town, that's not how this town has done it in the past, but it's how a lot of communities do it. Kathy? Well, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment that not everyone who's on septic would prefer sewer. So, so this is, it seems like it's a discussion for a future date. I mean, there's some people who aren't on water because they're on wells. Um, so it just uh, how we might do it. And I, I really want to underscore what Lynn said that we've got a May 2nd vote on a school. Um, and, and my mind just needs to get around all of these what else is happening to our taxpayer base, whether it's in the enterprise funds where they have to have, if you have water and sewer from the town, you have to pay those bills. So I do think timing of this really matters a lot. Um, and if we make a decision, is it in the, in the F, uh, Sean showed an FY24, we ought to have that as a decision we can make rather than a decision that's already made. Um, so at least be able to, look at that piece um so do we if we we're going to do it it's good to tell people it's coming but you don't necessarily have to start it in fy24 it could start in fy25 so i just want to think a little bit of, uh, have a better sense of the whole basket um uh, i'll come back to that kathy with yeah, I guess this is a question for those who've been working on this more closely with the other committees. Is the decision around ownership of the lines sort of settled or, or is there still, are you still looking for sort of the insurance information and what would be sort of the comparison of, you know, somebody pays $100 more on their water and sewer bills or they put $100 towards insurance if they choose to? Um, and what do you get for that? Maybe I'll see if Anna has a response to that. Yeah, uh, pretty settled. So <laughs> this is something that we uh, TSO and I know Andy and and Amy can chime in on this too. TSO really did land on this versus the insurance, mostly because it felt like 
the most equitable option, right? So it feels like everyone chipping in versus, um, you know, folks who can afford insurance get to avoid the the situation where their water line gets crushed under the road from big trucks, even though they can't control that. And now they're stuck with a tens of thousand dollar bill. Um, this really spread out that um, spread out that cost. And so, you know, the insurance, because it's an opt in um, and because I, I could not, I can't find in my email, Paul, I don't know if you found it, but I couldn't find the prices. Um, because it's an opt-in, we're not we're still privileging folks, right? We're still privileging um, those who have the ability to pay instead of spreading this out across the town. So that was one of the reasons why we landed on this. Um, and I don't know if Amy or Guilford have other things to to add, but this is this was very settled um, from from TSO. But Anna, that's each person making a decision whether they want it versus Bob, does the town just buy an insurance policy that insures people? Correct? Right. In which case everyone's everyone's prices would go up as well. Um, and I don't know, Lynn has something to add to that. I don't know that um, I don't have the numbers on that in front of me. Um, I'm not sure that it came through as a viable option or not. I, I don't think we ever explored the town having and taking out insurance for private property. I think we yeah. only explored what private property insurance might cost an individual. Yes, I believe and so. And that's even different from the question that Bob raised earlier, which was, should the town insure for our part of this? Right. Yeah, Amy. I, I more just want to speak to, you know, one of the questions that I think Kathy asked in all of that is, you know, do we look at these regs and do we have to make a decision that this is effective in FY24 or do we look in the future? Um, and certainly, you know, that that's a conversation that you guys can have. Um, I'm, I'm going to stand on my soapbox for a little bit and say that both the water and sewer regs, there's a lot of stuff in there that's really important for us to move forward that's outside of this sewer service issue. And so I really want to see these move forward <laughs> regardless of where the town lands. And obviously we just need to go into it with our eyes open. And I do think that even if we say, hey, we're not going to, we're going to implement all of this, but maybe not the sewer line bit until 2025. I guarantee if you have a leaky service or you've got a sewer line that's got some roots going up, it, you're just going to wait out the clock and put it on the town's bill. You know, so I think that once we make this decision and make it forward, the town's going to kind of own it whether they all stack up to when we have to pay for it or whether it happens immediately. Uh, just my opinion though. Yeah, I get concerned that uh, those homeowners that have to do something under the roadway during the interim period are gonna be very unhappy that the decision was made. We all heard from the one homeowner about um, the expense that she incurred with the water line and uh, if that happens um, during an interim period because it was delayed, that homeowner or any other homeowner would be very unhappy that we delayed the switch. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. Bernie? Um, Amy's point is really well taken. Uh, you know, we're very fond of pointing to uh, uh, police, fire, community responders as emergency services, but we tend to ignore there's a lot of essential stuff that DPW does, uh, both in terms of water and sewer and, uh, um, and in terms of emergency response. So it, it's, I think it's important that we move forward with this. Um, if we need to um, do some explaining, that's why I said it would be helpful if we could somehow segregate the funds. Uh, the other concern that I have in the back of my head here is the DEP is making changes in the septic system regulations, which is causing a great deal of concern right now out of the Cape. But uh, at some point we'll come inland and bother us where we have uh, property that's on septic now, but is marginal when it comes to doing any kind of upgrades. So um, we need, we've got a lot of a lot of fish to fry here, and, and uh, uh, I'd be I'd be inclined to put this in place um, and probably uh, work to phase it in. Keep our fingers crossed that we don't have um, an inordinate number of repairs that we have to do in the intervening two to three years that this gets phased in. 
Anna? Yeah, I, Bernie, thank you for that point. I think it's it's a good one. And I also want to just, you know, one of the big advantages to this plan, and in addition to sort of spreading out the um, sort of making sewer really a community resource, that's the floweriest way I can think of saying that, but it's true. Um, the other thing about this is that we also, it's it's improving our infrastructure, right? And so right now you can have lines that aren't, like Amy said, you know, you can kind of just keep kicking the can down the road unless it's really busted. Um, and the way that this is written um, with with DPW going in and, and you know, upgrading people's services and up and, and fixing things that are broken, it really is ultimately leading to an improvement in our infrastructure that will down the road lead to fewer things getting neglected and getting, you know, um, placed in the wrong spot and, and all of that. So there's there's short-term and long-term benefits to this, in my opinion, as well. Okay, additional questions. At this point, um, the, the regulation that TSR reviewed was extremely complex uh, because it was dealing with a number of issues that Amy referenced earlier that are important for our compliance with uh, regulations that are requirements on the on the town so that there was some urgency on getting through them they were not matters that really had a financial implication this was the one that had a direct financial implication because it was going to affect rates and that's why it's here because we review at the finance committee the rates every year um, so i just wanted to point that out um, i think that the question is do we need more or um, are we in a position where we should uh, just uh, have the finance committee consider a motion uh, to support the, the change. I think TSO has already taken that action and it's now waiting on finance before it goes to the council. And Amy's explained it. Uh, Kathy. Um, I'm willing to do a motion, but I really need a memo that pulls this together for people. And I am I am fine with cross not getting into the weeds of the bigger regulations and just cross-referencing the TSO report, but the report could just have the not flower. What was Anna? What's a good <laughs> the financial impact of doing this kind of summary? You know that this is where we th think rates are going, base rates, but the sewer improvement, and we can write it in a way that says, you know, this is buying an improved infrastructure and protecting everybody, we can write those words. I just think I would like that to come with the motion. So if we can write that next week or something, but not just send a motion forward, that 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 would be my preference. And wow. I'm, I may be talking like two pages. I'm not talking about a tome. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm hearing is that you would like to see the finance committee would approve the sewer regulations and maybe you would ask for us to have a, an implementation plan for the financial aspects of of the um, plan. So anything that's going to impact the, the rate payers, you'd say, well, when, when would we implement that piece? So it could be a, a phased thing to take into account the uh, increases in taxes and all the things that people are we're trying to help manage, pay people manage. Is that Am I accurate on that, Kathy? Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, Sean has done these, not nicely. I said it's not a lot of words. And if you do some of it in a table and just there's some sentences above it, um, it would be great uh, so that people can, yes, uh, I won't say any more about that, Paul. So I'm, I'm thinking short, but clear. <laughs> yeah. And we can say we approve the motion and here's the attached document that talks about the phase in and the impact um, and you guys prepare that. So Lynn, I'm, I'm see you, you know, I, I just want right. something to come with us, not just a motion. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm agreeing. I, it seems to me that our job as a finance committee is to look at the financial impact. I think our discussion has been appropriate in that we've talked about 
phasing in, although I really have to look to Guilford and Amy and Paul to and Sean on how would you phase this in. Um, but what I'm also hearing from Amy is we don't want to hesitate to pass the rest of the bylaw uh, and our motion for the council will need to include a motion to adopt the bylaw and the phase in plan. So at some point we will need to see that phase in plan. Yeah, so any so I guess I need more clarification. We've proposed a number that we want to start with in terms of the impact that we think we'll have in the first year. Um, we'll evaluate that impact in the first year to see if the amount we've set aside is sufficient or enough, sufficient, or if we have to increase it more. Um, I view that differently than a phase in plan where we're phasing in pieces of the regulation. So um, my understanding is we're phasing in all the regulations and really what we're talking about is you know, different levels of of funding set set aside for the the line replacements, um, and we can show that we can show if it's five hundred thousand dollars, if it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, if it's a million dollars, um, what that what those different levels are. Um, but ultimately, we won't know for sure until we we implement the regulations and we see how the year goes. Um, Sonia, uh, you know, had messaged me that you know these will. The, the cost for these line replacements will be set up as a capital article. So what that means is they will be a separate account with the money that we are estimating for these line replacements specifically tied to that account. And when uh, Guilford or Amy spend, they'll charge those accounts. So, so in year one, for example, we'll have that $500,000 set up, we'll spend it down. If they spend less than that $500,000, it'll carry over to the next year and they'll be able to charge it. Um, but if they're right on, we'll request another capital article the next year. So so there will be ways to track it. I think that will be satisfying to the committee to monitor how much we're spending on this. Um, but in terms of, I, I guess, am I, am I off on the phase in or is that what, you, is what I described sort of what you're looking for? I think basically what we're saying is we're both of these have a bylaw and regulations. And what we're saying is once we pass the bylaw and accept the regulations or whatever the correct term would be for the council's role with regard to regulations. We are going to move to implementation immediately. And this will, um, we will move to implementation immediately. And the first that people will see the change in their rates will be FY24. J July 1st, right? Would, July 1st, would, FY, right. Yep. July 1st, 2023, right. which is FY24. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sean and Paul, does that fit with, if we pass these regulations in January, does that give you the kind of time you need at a council level? Does that give you the kind of time you need to bring that into the budget discussions for FY24? So the cost pieces moving right now, the, the sewer line, the service line, the, the homeowners responsible from the main to the home mm -hmm. and we're moving it to the property line to the home. So it's that 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 new piece of pipe that the town is now taking responsibility on. That's the cost increase. That's right. the policy decision the council is making. And mm -hmm. there's a cost that goes along with that because that's shifting it from the private property owner to the to the town. And so the question is, you can manage that two ways. One is sort of put some money aside and start to manage it over time and see what that number looks like over yeah. time. Or you can say, we're going to make that effective in year three, you know, but um, up until then. But I think that Amy has identified, well, then you can see a lot of people just not fix their sewer lines. Um, and that's a problem. So I think that that's sort of the, the sort of economic decision that the council is faced with. And what, what I would suggest and, that, that we could give you a plan for how to implement that. And January 1st, I think would be fine in terms of um, uh, in terms of building into our normal process for presenting the water rates and having it go to finance committee and, and be reviewed and all of that. Um, January would be, if, if it can be done in January, that would give us time. I mean, that's the current plan is that right. this would all come to the council and finish up in January. Um, I, that was my initial question. And then, but 
I, it does seem to me then that when we look at the rates for FY24 for sewer and water, we will be adopting rates that now reflect this additional cost. Yes. Okay. You had some swing that's yes. Bob? See yeah, I, I just want to say that before I could either support or not support this, I need to see a little bit more information about the strategies for paying for this, you know, whether it's, you know, just in the rate in the water and sewer rates or whether there's an insurance policy or whether we have other options. And maybe you guys have already discussed that. I haven't seen it. So I need to see what the obvious, what the what the options are and make sure we're, we're choosing the option that has the lowest cost over time. Yeah, so we can bring back, again, th there's not gonna be an insurance policy for regular replacement that we would do for road repairs. I, I just, knowing how insurance works, I can't imagine there's gonna be a policy that will cover that. So, but we can get numbers on what it would be for the town to insure against those sort of unexpected breaks that, um, or not roads we're repairing where we do have to go in and, and tear it up. Um, we th That's probably covered under our current insurance already, but we can look and see if there's an additional cost to if, it, if it's not covered. Um, and we can include that in the memo that uh, we're going to provide. Okay, thank you. Just one comment on that. It would seem to me, Sean, that our insurance company would need to be aware of the change in policy because they may change our rates. So uh, it's feeling that we can wait for the motion until we get the further memo that John just described. Is there any objection from staff in doing that? So we delay it, it would, or do we want to uh, go ahead and? Uh, I, I would, I'd feel better to. Have the, when do we meet next, Mandy? Andy, we're meeting on the six. So we have two. I think so. We're meeting on the twentieth, I believe. If we're going to keep our current schedule of meeting after council, um, if we are going to be on the twentieth, that would be sufficient time for us to put together the memo that um, you're asking okay. for. We we actually have to discuss that later in the meeting because of other problems that may force us to think about an earlier meeting. Okay, uh, but that does that give you enough time that if you want to come back to the full council with this? And are you saying in this January? Like, um, yes. Does that give you enough time? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, Lynn, you're muted. Said so we're looking at January for bringing this to the council, and because it's a by law, it's going to have our first reading and adoption. Okay. Okay. So we would uh, hope in a December, one of we will have at least one more December meeting to come back to this, and uh, Sean can let Amy and Guilford know what we decide on the next meeting date. So they don't have to hang around the meeting just to find that out since we're not going to discuss it till later. Uh, is there anything else that people want to ask now about this issue? Otherwise, uh, we're uh, going to get ready to move on. And I would ask uh, Kathy if so, and Kathy's going to make the uh, text message. Uh, we're going to financial guidelines now, Andy, that not the other. Thank you very much, um, yeah. by the way, for your okay. tour. Uh, also I, okay. so Amy and Guilford, thank you very much. It's been very helpful. And um, if you don't, you know, if you're willing to um, please uh, share the um, uh, PowerPoint through Sean so that we can get the numbers exact when uh, we double check against the minutes. Will do. Okay, thank you. Sean, can you throw me back in the audience when you have a chance? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I was gonna actually, uh, so uh, uh, 
Anna uh, will be with us la later for our third agenda item, but uh, at this point, uh, she's going to go back into the to the audience level, and uh, we want to switch to the uh, discussion last night of the um, guidelines and uh, see if we can make some progress on it because that will actually help inform our later discussion about next meeting, whether we need an additional meeting. I think that one of the things that uh, happened last night is that uh, uh, we, uh, at the, towards the end of the meeting, um, there was a request made that we give uh, the word version of the guidelines to members of the council so that members of the council could make suggestions and comments. Um, and we haven't received any as of this point. We um, have not actually set a deadline, so. Uh, uh, Andy, Pam Rooney sent you an email, you and me. Um, it came in an hour ago. So she did send comments in addition to the comments we got last night. Yeah, at this point we have the comments we got last night. Um, I didn't put on on the spot. She had been talking about uh, submitting comments and we left it open. And I think we would need um, at this point in any event to let um, counselors as a whole know when we would need to get comments because we don't want to foreclose other counselors uh, at this point from submitting additional comments if they have them. It would be very difficult, but uh, I think it's important that we uh, go through the uh, questions that came up last night and uh, uh, proceed in fashion. Michelle, I know you're back. I'm going to uh, have to do this to just ask you to confirm that uh, you can hear and we can hear you again. Yes. So that... yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, in this uh, Athena taking care of the minutes later, is that the plan, Sean, as far as you know? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, she has not asked uh, me to take the minutes or I don't think she asked anybody. So one of us will capture the minutes based on the video. Okay, so um, we'll just let it be, uh, let it show that at five minutes after four that uh, Alicia rejoined the meeting. And um, she's not here yet. No, she's not here. Andy, you thought Michelle had left, but Michelle hasn't. She's here. Oh. Alicia's not back. Alicia's not back. I'm sorry. And she's not in the audience. I did text her, but I don't always get, it depends on whether she's in the middle of something, whether I get an immediate response. Maybe we can go through the things we heard last night. Um, Okay, why don't we do that quickly? And then uh, the other thing is, is that I think that uh, Mandy had uh, ha has a uh, time limit today too. And uh, so our third agenda item is the um, real estate transfer fee. So we wanna make sure that we do it while they're available. And I just wanna, um, make it very clear on something for when they join the meeting for that purpose. And that is because there are um, already um, five members of the council present. If the two of them join us, then it's a quorum of the council. So we consult, I consulted Athena this morning. And what Athena said is that since they're co-sponsors, that we should limit their participation in the next section of the meeting when we get there to only questions and answers, and we should not do any deliberation while they are um, attending the meeting and uh, participants as opposed to attend attendees. And I will repeat that uh, when we get there, but um, I just wanted to let you know that we did check with Athena and got direction from her on how to proceed. When you had uh, gone through and taken some notes on um, what you heard, and uh, then we'll see what others who were at the meeting last night when they added 
questions that come up from those who are not there, which is our resident members. So uh, I'm not going to claim I got them all, um, but the first note I made was on page four, and it was the question about whether this in this paragraph is embedded something that constitutes a suggested policy change with regard to the reparations stabilization fund. I'm just going to go through them and see if there's others I've missed, okay? Um, the second thing I picked up was, um, the, it was questioned why just these were listed here. Shouldn't it be all the policy goals and and how that relates to the rest of the sentence? Lynn, can I just say that in addition to that, the suggestion was that if we broke the paragraph, so after the single year, <laughs> Um, the next one became a paragraph. So we might, so because people were reading it is that we might have to forgo climate action or because those have been flagged. So it was a suggestion of just separate those two thoughts instead of one paragraph, make it two, was one way of solving the, uh, okay. the, way, it was re the way it was reading. Yep, got it. Uh, the next was... Um, down here, and this is where I stuck the question about the salary study this year and when we're doing that and so forth. Okay. Um, then uh, there was a question as to um, this being referred not just to BCG, but to the finance committee. Okay. Then down here uh, was a comment I'm not sure, this is when I'm not sure I have the full intent, but uh, the whole issue of making sure that we view this with regard to a climate lens. Um, the next one was um, just a note to us that we need a motion to refer the policy regarding surplus real property disposition to the finance committee, but this is a place where I think we also want Paul to weigh in because there actually in the past has been a separate committee that has looked not at the policy, but looked at the application or recommendations to come based on the policy. Um, and then um, toward this part, uh, we did make a note about pilot legislation. And those were the notes I picked up, but I, you know, was trying to run the meeting and make notes. So um, open no, to and, the, and just could I speak on the pilot legislation that was that the way we get money back from the state, the formula. So it's a similar issue to the charter that the formula for state owned land. So it was to make it clear that it's not just. It's not just the charter. Um, so so it was to, I think, add a sentence there, Lynn, um, to review that. I think there's a whole lot more to this than just that. Because yeah, it's, so, yeah, it's pilot so, legislation with regard to state-owned land, and then it's, private leg it's pilot legislation to privately owned land. Right. There are two separate kinds of legislation, or bills. Um, and Alyssa, Alicia said she was coming soon, so people should just keep, she tends to come in on the uh, general public line. Yeah, I'm uh, watching that side. But she said, got it, we'll be there soon. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm, I'm just uh, anticipating that she wanted, looked at here is the whole issue of our fields and our recreation. And I open to suggestions about where we think that would fit in. Can you, I'm, I've got, well, I've got it up on mine too. We have a line on um, an overall plan. There's a, let me, I'll go to my own document so I can find it. But we have a line that talks about a long-term plan for town-owned conservation land. I'm not sure we have recreation land. Um, 
that so it was in addition to the buildings and i thought that would be a place to put it um so um let me just try to yeah i'm get... searching and i'm not getting okay and it may be in goals not here <laughs> Because commercial yeah, property. Yeah, because I don't recall it. I've heard this so many times. Okay, let me just look. So why don't you go up to the top again, to the first item that was listed in order, which may have been the reparations, I believe. Yes. I mean, Andy, do you want to... I, I'm, I want to be sensitive to the fact that we've asked Anna and Mandy Joe to be here. How much time do you want to spend on trying to edit into this versus just noting? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Maybe we should just um, at this point note it and see if there are any questions from um, members of the committee who are not in attendance last night about um, general impressions of what happened or anything else that they would like to hear. Okay, I'm just gonna say on page eight is the paragraph where I thought we could add it. Um, they, it's, it starts with the capital budget includes debt services. This policy essential to maintain and improve infrastructure. Then we do streets, town buildings. If we put town land and recreation, Oh. You see the paragraph, Lynn? Oh, right there. Got it. So I, I think that is the, like there's a big picture of what's on the list for this year, next year, 10 years from now. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I, I'm just foreshadowing based on what Alicia was um, trying Alicia, to do. Just come into the audience. No, and it's what occurred me to me last night as a place to stick it because mm -hmm. we also don't have a budget in FY24 to do what we need to do as Bob had put in, you know, to fix our build, you know, worry about our buildings, you know, what's the plan on them here, um, but it's buildings and land. Um, yeah, I thought it was a place to put it and I see Maybe. Bob, I'll stop talking. And Bob has his hand up. Yeah, I I just, uh, before we do that, Alicia, you're here. This, yes, thank you, Andy. Okay, let the minutes reflect the time that you came uh, at uh, 20 after four. Thank you. Bob. I, I just had a, a, a question about uh, as a point of order or whatever, but um, if, if these are comments from the council and the council wants to change these guidelines, why does anyone in this committee need to uh, address them? I mean, isn't the council uh, the, the decision-making body? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, it has been the tradition of this uh, process that um, in order to make sure that the wording comes out correct and to give finance committee an opportunity to um, inform the council about additional comments about any change that um, we do take it back through the committee one last time and have the revisions done in a, uh, so that it ends up being a single cohesive document by um, having the editing done at the committee level and not at the council level, which is why it's kind of like a first and second reading approach um, for, for the guidelines. We've just done that every year. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, so I had one, just a, sort of a minor thing. It was really at the very last section where we talk about pilot fees. And I thought someone in the past had said pilot is a, is a, is a dirty word for <laughs> some of the uh, institutions in town. Maybe we could just reduce, just get a eliminate it. Like in this paragraph here, two paragraphs above the one that's highlighted, assessment of fees, you know, instead of pilot fees. I mean, just just a thought. I mean, it it, it may not, it, you know, and I, I realize there may be, there is a pilot, um, well, the, the, the state is 
presumably working on some sort of pilot legislation, but I don't know. I just, if there's a way to not bring in pilot, given what my, I understand is the sensitivity, we should eliminate it, that's all. Not and a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanna mention, I can't raise my hand, or at least I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Um, the reality is our higher ed institutions do pay fees. They pay for sewer, they pay for water. We get reimbursement for services such as ambulance and fire. So confusing that the word fees is somewhat confusing to them. The philosophy of pilot is a much different philosophy. And I, I'm sorry if they're offended by the word, but when you sit on 38% of our land, then, and you're not getting any taxes, that's payment in lieu of taxes. Um, so, and higher ed institutions all over the country are facing this kind of demand from the communities that they sit in. And some of the Boston institutions are actually forking up some big bucks. So I, you know, they may not like it. They may want to donate pianos to the Drake instead, uh, but that's the problem. Well, the one thing I would say, Lynn, is that the legislation, as opposed to pilots, which, which we're going and asking for payment, would actually allow, at least one version of it, would allow us to tax a share of their property value. You know, so it's it's not payment in lieu of taxation, it's taxation at a reduced rate, you know, wh whatever you want to call it. And I don't think they would be happier with that wording, Bob. You know, it's <laughs> I mean, there the, another form of the legislation wants to tax the amount they have in their foundation funds. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're about as excited about that as anybody would be. Well, the, the city of Boston allows um for uh actions that benefit the community in terms of their pilot program. And when you look at the actual amount of money that the 47 institutions who qualify for the Boston pilot program contribute, it works out to be nine tenths of 1% of Boston's operating budget a year. So mm -hmm. it's not big, but well, it's, it's big bucks in as much as Boston spends $3.7 billion a year operating. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the overall budgetary impact, it's not that, that great. So I would think if we're going to, we, we, we want to talk to um, tax exempts in general, not just the three colleges um, or two colleges in the university, which is a whole different thing um, about, you know, what actions they might take to benefit the community. And Amherst College leaves a considerable amount of property to the tax rules. That's an action that benefits the community. And, and you know, we want to be able to recognize that and encourage that as well as gifts. Uh, we do mention on page nine in the letter that Northampton Smith is a multiple year agreement with Northampton, which is a little bit um, of a misconstruction. Uh, when Northampton, uh, when Mayor Narkowitz proposed his pilot program, the reaction he got from Smith College was no. Um, Smith has given gifts to Northampton uh, regularly and the half million dollars is a three year gift uh, that the college gave to Northampton to be spent at the mayor's discretion. It's not the function of any kind of formal pilot program. So um, I, I'd like to move us, we, we need to talk with the, the tax exempts, not just the colleges, but all the tax exempts in town about making some contributions. Um, and I'd like to move us away from thinking that this is somehow this immense pot of gold that we're just gonna open up in mind. Um, uh, you know, so if we're going to mention pilot programs, uh, let's talk about contributions and let's talk about actions that might benefit the community. Uh, to be clear about what happened in Northampton, uh, uh, Darkwoods and I believe uh, even beforehand, uh, Claire Higgins would uh, press for legislation through uh, their the legislative delegation and uh, by continuing to press for litigation even though it, uh, legislation even though it never uh, came to fruition during that time 
it did get their attention and uh, the legislation has generally been written that it's not mandatory it's uh, something that town can opt to do and it was uh, viewed by Northampton that if they could get that uh, legislation it would be a negotiating tool I, I was having conversations with Claire at the time because I had 20% uh, of Deerfield's um, property either controlled by the state or by tax exempt organizations and was dealing with three schools which gave us gifts and we had our own way of negotiating those gifts but we never uh, was never a formalized um, pilot program so uh, you know I, I, I think that uh, and, and again the, you know going by what was reported in the Hampshire Gazette um, Smith decided to give Northampton Five, half a million dollars to be spent at the discretion of the mayor over a three-year period of time, which amounts to less than uh, one, it amounts to about one-tenth of one percent of Northampton's operating budget over those three years. Um, nice gift, big impact, no. Uh, Smith also gave some money for community connections and they gave uh, another grant for another project. They've they've been very targeted in how they've, they've given money. So, um, I, I just think if we're going to we're going to talk about pilots, we want to be reasonable about it. And um, uh, again, just simply include that phrase. You know, they can take other actions that benefit the community. Uh, and, and again, an example of that would be uh, maybe a, a you know maybe a piano to uh, a performance space isn't the greatest gift in the world, but um, it's it's a start. Action access to their track and field. <laughs> no, I'm just saying there there are some community. Deerfield Academy, Deerfield Academy maintained the town of Deerfield's playing fields as part of their income contribution. Interesting. Or, or or helping to maintain them, you know, with the school that they have that does turf maintenance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, I mean, those are those are the kinds of things that were that were helpful uh, when we had an emergency. They. Uh, uh, the uh, Deerfield Academy's kitchen fed our, uh, our, our our firefighters, police, and EMTs. Um, you, you know, there were things like that that that, that went on that were valuable, but um, uh, weren't financial contributions. Yeah, you know, weren't, weren't actual money. And then they gave us a gift. So, okay. um, so that's noted uh, is a topic for discussion when we return to it because I don't I we're not going to complete this today this is obvious for several different reasons but time being a big big number one of it um, are there other topics that should be added Kathy um, what I was going to suggest is two things. One is Alicia. Uh, um, Sean says he's been trying to bring her in. She's in the audience. Um, but what I was going to suggest is, I mean, I can work with you. I can work with Lynn. That we can do a red line edit that incorporate, you know, addresses these things. Many of these are word wordsmithing, Bob, rather than major changes. The one question is, did we mean to change a policy on reparations because it looks like it the way we wrote it? So we could do a red line version that incorporates a few others we got um, was just pure suggesting of a word switch. So we're not trying to edit with the third. And then we could share that document and maybe we get to a final document that way. You know, just if we've agreed there, I don't have anything else. This lit, what was flagged last night, um, and what we did just to today. So I don't know whether anyone, but I was thinking of getting to the next agenda item as a way of not trying to actually figure out what the word should be in each of these places. I know that there was one other uh, thing that came up and uh, uh, I think it was Anna and she was gonna uh, submit suggested language to us by um, edits on, a version of the uh, a word version of the guidelines, and that had to do, I believe, with uh, um, how to look at things through a climate lens. And uh, so we'll uh, we can't really uh, finish this out until we've given counselors 
not just uh, one counselor, but all counselors, an opportunity and notice of what the deadline is. So uh, I'll just stop there, Michelle. I was just making sure that Alicia was in the room when Kathy made the suggestion about adding um, the language around the fields. And if she wasn't, just if that could be reiterated. Uh, I, I'm in my car, so I can't see whose hands are raised or anything, but. Alicia is in the room and her hand is raised. So oh, Alicia okay. <laughs> sorry, Alicia. <laughs> Alicia. Sorry, are you following up? Okay, I wasn't sure, sorry. Um, thank you, Michelle. So I actually was gonna ask that question and I was not in the room when Kathy made the suggestion. So I'd prefer to hold off on my comments and hear what Kathy's suggestion was, if that's okay. Okay, okay uh, Kathy, why don't you repeat it? Yeah, if you can see the screen, Alicia, I said on page eight, we have a, a, a section that talks about capital. So one-time expense, and adding the words right before it said infrastructure, including streets, sidewalks, town buildings, I suggested adding recreational fields, track and fields um, to that as a list where we want a plan of how we're planning on doing that um, to be developed. So I was adding those words to something that says, you know, this is a this is an issue that we need to be addressing on a, and we can do it on a multi-year basis. Um, so that was the place I thought that it fit to, that we had not mentioned that as part of our assets, the way we've mentioned buildings, roads, sidewalks. Awesome, thank you, Kathy. I, and I'm pretty sure that that adequately addresses uh, the concerns that I had, but I just wanna make sure that essentially this would be doing what I was trying to do with my motion for at least the 2B portion in terms of like uh, creating a pos or finding out what the possibilities are for fixing the uh, recreational facilities. That's what this would do, right? Yep. And it's, okay, it's now written, it's recreational facilities and land. So just for people who haven't done the JCPC side of all of this, we get a what looks feasible within the budget for FY24? And then what, what's on the list of high priority that we couldn't get to this year, but when we think we would get to it. So we get that for a lot of things, but so far we've never had it for fields. Um, at least, Andy, at least in the few years that I've been, been on JCP there, you know, we've had it for playgrounds. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had those on the list. So, you know, the town owned pieces. So I thought this would be a place to add it as uh, something that we want the big, a big picture. And I see Sean's hand is up um, as I'm adding this, this category. Yeah, Sean and Sean. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, because we take these, you know, Paul and I take these budget guidelines really seriously. We wanna, you know, I just wanna make sure I fully understand sort of what's, what this ad is requesting. So, um, so the way capital requests get created are that department heads, you know, who are responsible for different areas of, uh, of the town, you know, they identify the needs, they maintain their own sort of um, sort of running list of what's of what is needed to be repaired. And they submit requests each year and we kind of capture the five years worth on our five year plan. Um, so fields that are part of schools those requests would typically come in from the school department. Um, so for example, the elementary schools, those requests would come in from the school department as a capital request for Fort River, Wildwood, Crocker Farm. Um, if it's a, a non-school field like Plumbrook or, or something along those lines, it would likely come in from our DPW or our conservation department. If it's a regional school field, it doesn't come in the same way. Um, and, and I am including community field. I know it's owned by the town. Um, but the primary user of community field is the regional schools with the football field and the baseball field and softball field there. Um, regional requests typically come in through a debt assessment, which we do talk about um, at joint capital planning, but it's but that process starts with the superintendent and the and the school business manager um, presenting their own capital plan to the regional school committee with what their highest priorities are. Um, school committee makes a decision on what they want to add to their capital plan, what they want to approve each year. 
um, they will vote on something and then that goes to all four towns to consider and each town all four member towns of the region to consider and then if it's approved then it gets rolled in to our uh, to the town of Amherst capital plan as a debt assessment and so you know hearing the the specificity of the motion that was proposed last night at the council and then seeing this I just I want to make sure are are we proposing some sort of change to that process or are we just saying to or, or is this more meant to be a reminder to think about our fields when we develop the capital plan Lisa um thank you so I don't have an exact answer to that question Sean but I have another question in that so is is it not possible for the town to take or make initiative on any of the fields so I think when I brought this up at the council meeting last night I, I ran into the same challenges in terms of the, the like ownership and whose responsibility is whose of which fields um, and so if we're saying like the town owned fields is that more specific and would that change things than just saying recreational land yeah, I mean, so I'm wondering if that yeah. specification would be helpful and then also like since we own the <clears throat> community field and we received so much public comment from the people who play on the field and I know there was even a parent who came yesterday who said there was a, a divot in the field that he fixed himself so that his kid wouldn't get hurt can we not just take initiative to say at least well this is what it would take to fix it and not even necessarily say like, yeah, we're gonna fix it right now, but just like looking into what it would take for us to make that happen. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Community field is sort of the outlier because it's because it's a town owned field, but it, again, the, the the users are the regional schools. And, and I guess it's a question for the finance committee. I mean, I know I sort of sit in a place where if there are going to be improvements to the community field, I feel like the other member towns should share in paying for that because their students are the primary, you know, the, the split that we have with the member towns of the region. Um, they are all users of the community field for athletics. Um, if the town was going to pursue this sort of independently, that would, would mean the town is deciding um, to sort of go it alone, uh, which could be an option. But it, I guess it's a, it's a decision that the council will want to make if you're in these guidelines, are you telling us to consider going it alone on something like community field and not go through the regular regional process, which would allocate the costs out um, according to the regional agreement? Um, or, you know, these budget guidelines are budget guidelines for the town manager, the budget guidelines for me, but they, you know, they, they also can be, you know, perceived as budget guidelines for all departments of, of the town, you know, there could be sort of a a section here that you know is something we could convey to the regional schools of you know the council you know is the the town of Amherst is one of the largest the largest member town of the region. We really think when you develop your budget, you should think about this. Um, and it could also be could go that way as well. I guess the other thing I should point out is uh, the other source of funds for recreational is uh, Community Preservation Act funds. Mm -hmm. That's an entirely different process. But this and just and just so everyone knows, the region's about or Amherst is about eighty percent of the region. So, if if we you know if it's a million dollar project, just to keep it simple, it would mean Amherst picking up an extra two hundred thousand dollars or so um, that would otherwise be contributed by the other towns. And can I? Sorry, I wasn't sure if you my because I kept my hand up, but I had more to add. Is it okay if I respond yeah, again? Ahead. Okay, so I think in, in my opinion, at least, I'm not sure what Kathy's intentions were we're adding, is that I think the need is apparent. I think what's not apparent is like the capacity, like what our capacity is as a town to be addressing these things. So I think that's what I'm, that's the information at least that I was looking for. And so even just like these are the options, kind of a similar thing that we had in terms of the capital projects and um, when we looked at funding percentages, so like maybe even something like, well, if we funded it a hundred percent, we couldn't even do this until the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Or if we were to fund the 80%, we could do it in this year and we would need the other towns to also have a portion in this year so that we at least have like an idea as to what it would realistically take. So I think I'm not looking for changing any processes, but just like making the options more clear in terms of capacity. 
Can I respond to that quickly, Andy? Yes. I think that makes sense. Um, and again, I, th I think it's something we would work collaboratively with the region on. Um, be, you know, one of the issues with any of these fields, um, with, with doing these field projects is, you know, if we do move forward with the, the track and the field within the track project next year, like the hope is, um, we wouldn't be ready to do, I don't think, a community field project next year anyway, because taking community field offline and ha having that track and field offline the same year, um, I think that would really be an impediment to the to the programming and the sports up there. So they'd probably have to be phased in a certain way anyway, like uh, the memo we provided last night sort of calls for another review and sort of a phasing plan for how you would address these fields. So I think that it is something we can work with the regional schools on um, because it's become a, a high priority for the council. Lynn has her hand up, Andy. Yeah, Lynn. Yeah, Alicia, I'm, I'm really glad you're capturing this. And I, I've taken notes. I don't know if you can see the screen and it's so small, you'd need a magnifying glass. But um, I just want to echo Alicia's sympathy about this. Um, you know, <laughs> realizing how poor our fields are has been an eye opener for all of us. Kate Atkinson. And um, I really... Um, want to make sure that through our regional budget process and our CPA process, we, you know, bump this up on the list uh, so that we begin to uh, take better care of these items. That's just my statement of support for this. Yeah, I don't know if uh, we are going to be able to have this discussion when we uh, have our four town meeting. But I think that Sean has actually raised a very uh, good point that if the region does it, um, it sort of creates the understanding that it is a regional enterprise to get it done. We still pay 80% of it, however, but it, um, it, they're, they're the ones who take the leadership and provide the uh, you know, provide the impetus for other towns to participate, recognizing that their kids play on the field. I mean, we heard from um, pe from people with kids in other towns during the last few nights of meetings. So uh, I don't know if uh, it'd be worth someone having a discussion with the superintendent and the finance director of regional schools regarding uh, their willingness to take that on. Sean, did you have any? Yeah, I mean, I think it is appropriate for the next four town meeting. Um, for usually the first four town meeting of the year, they'll, you know, they'll solicit input from the four towns and feedback from the four towns. And I think it's certainly appropriate for the representatives from Amherst to say, this is a high priority. We'd, you know, we'd like to see this in the budget, uh, in the capital plan or in the budget um, that's presented, you know, sort of a, thoughts around this so okay so what I, um where, where i think that we're at I'm, and i'm doing this based upon the clock um is that uh, we really need to talk about an additional meeting uh to come back to this the lynn i appreciate your taking the notes that you have and by circulating that item everybody will share in the notes and uh, then anybody from the committee can add to it. We will invite other counselors to also submit their suggestions and come back on another date, which we're gonna fix at the end of the meeting to uh, complete the work on the, uh, on a you know, consolidated draft and to answer a uh, question that Bob had raised earlier. I think it's just, easier for a committee than an entire council to come up with a consolidated draft, which is why we do it the way we do it. Uh, but um, I wanted to at least uh, pause for a few minutes because I we have a couple of uh, people from the um, Anna and Mandy Joe who are here to make a uh, presentation and answer questions about the, uh, uh, the the real estate transfer fee as it's been called. And uh, so they're being brought into the meeting and uh, uh, let me just check, Anna, you can 
hear in Mandy. You can hear. Yep. Hi. So as I said a few yep. minutes ago, and I just repeated really quickly that we have been advised by Athena that um, when you're here and there's a quorum of the council present, that we cannot deliberate on your request. We can only um, ask questions of you. Um, and uh, so I, I just wanted to make it clear that why we're doing this, uh, we're doing this on advice um, of Athena regarding compliance with the open meeting law. Andy, is it possible um, to keep one of us in the room after that, so we're not at seven. Uh, in case questions come up during deliberation, which I, I think I they all I don't know do. that we're going to have too much time to deliberate, but we want to get started. And I just want to uh, just do one introductory piece, and then I want to hear uh, what you guys are going to have to say to <laughs> begin us off. But um, the request will, uh, started with special legislation and a request as step one of a multi-step process to do um, to have the council do a request to the legislature for special legislation and there is a time limit on that because um, in a prior conversation with uh, representative dom uh, she advised that uh, at the beginning of the session, and I, I and uh, Lynn is going to check on the date at a um, at a regular meeting, that there is a date by which um, bills have to be filed. And while the actual bill doesn't have to be filed, what uh, she said to me was that uh, you have to um, at least file enough to create a placeholder. Was the words that she the word she used. And uh, so uh, I think that we need to be conscious of the fact that if uh, we're going to recommend step one of the multi-step process that uh, was described in your memo, we do need to be conscious that uh, there is a deadline date that we can't lose. And uh, so with that, um, I don't know, have you thought about, uh, do either one of you want to start us off? Anna can if <laughs> you would like. <laughs> sure, so um, we don't have a formal presentation. I mean, I think you all have, have seen our formal presentation for the most part. Um, and I believe that you received the memo that we wrote from Andy, which really explains this clearly. But one of the things that we were trying to do here was, uh, or, or some of the problems we were trying to address, we're not necessarily solving them, but we're trying to reach them through this uh, special legislation and accompanying bylaw is that we simply need more funds in order to protect capital A and lowercase a affordable housing in Amherst. But also we are seeing the impacts of inflation on both our general and especially our capital um, budgets. And so with the creation of the capital, capital stabilization fund this year, um, that's something that we are hoping to, to supplement through a property transfer fee. And there's a really important note here. This is not a tax. Um, that's something that has come up a couple of times. There's big differences between a tax and a fee. Um, this is a one-time property transfer fee uh, that is, is based on certain conditions around the, the property transfer. So um, I want to just make sure that's very, very clear. We are not proposing a new tax. Um, this, yeah, so on the front of it. The way that we built this is that we would be, uh, we started off writing a really complicated, convoluted special act that allowed us to only put a fee on certain types of transactions. And what we realized was that in order to get this through the legislature and in order to have flexibility to adjust this based on the needs of the town, what would make more sense is for us to propose a special act allowing the town to impose a 2% property transfer fee on uh, a, a blanket fee that is then governed by bylaw. So the, the transfer fee special act has many, many exemptions that we would then write a bylaw specifying what those were, right? So we are not, no one is planning to do a 2% fee on all property transfers. 
um, what the bylaw and we included some sample um, in our in our memo we included some sample a, a, a sample bylaw right that we would have to obviously write and pass but it would be you know um, homes on a, a two percent fee payable by both the buyer and the seller on 200% of the average property price. Um, and so we're basically, the goal here is to um, collect this fee from two types of properties. It would be both non-owner occupied properties. So if they're not claiming a homestead exemption um, and properties that are over 200% of the average uh, median sale price for the town or assess, excuse me, what did I do? Yeah, assess price for the town. Um, so that's the that's the general gist of it, and uh, those funds would then be similar to the way that reparations um, has has built their fund up. We would have the first, I believe it's five hundred thousand goes to Mandy. Am I right there? Sorry, uh, we proposed two fifty. One of the things that Thank you. needs a discussion. Yeah. So one of the things that we anticipate having a discussion on is the amount that would go to the affordable housing trust in our initial. Legislation we pitched 250. That was based on looking at what they have requested from CPA in the past and sort of trying to divvy that up a little bit. Um, and then the rest would be split between the general operating fund and the um, capital stabilization improvement fund. And so our our back of the ma napkin math, just to give you an idea of the impact of this for um, 2021, uh, this would have been about 1.4 million over 1.4 million. Um, so that would be you know. 33,000, these are rough, 33,000 from homes that are over 200% average assessed and um, and about 1.4 from non-owner occupied properties. So the this is the, that's the general overview. Mandy, if you have anything to add, I apologize y'all. My um, I got my booster yesterday and I'm still a little bit uh, coming out of that fog. So bear with me please today. Mandy, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I, I would add a couple things. Um... Uh, we, we say up to 2% in the bylaw. The bylaw is very um, general because it's, well, the special act would be very general because it's easier to change a bylaw if the special act goes through. I think the things that would need to be discussed are that percentage. 2% seems to be where most towns that file these fall. Um, some fall earlier, you know, lower, not too many go higher. Um, and then where the money would go, because once that's in, in the um, special act, we, we believe that, you know, in talks with um, Senator Comerford and Rep Dom, we need to put somewhere that the money's going. And so once it's in the special act, it can't really be changed. We've proposed this split that Anna talked about um, with some ability to deal with that split and, and adjust that at least as to anything remaining above the AMAHT portion, we picked a number for AMAHT. We have heard that it might not be enough. It might not be liked. Um, we just picked a number to start with. We will be talking to the Housing Trust on Thursday um, to, to get their ideas of the special act. Um, so we have, we're on their agenda for Thursday. Um, and then the other thing is those items that are exempt no matter what. So we've tried to say, let's put as much into the bylaw as possible, but section two says these items, these transfers have to be exempt. No matter what, if the special act passes, these have to be the ones in there. So getting that list right, making sure that that list includes only those we would never want to tax, um, to charge that fee for, um, never have that transfer fee on, is also important. So I think that's all I really want to say at this point. Okay, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm as usual, I look to other members of the committee first and try not to lead with my own questions. So I see three hands up and uh, Kathy, you were first. Um, so if, if you think of possible unintended consequences, as opposed to hope for consequences, which is, no one gets hurt very much as some wealthy property taxes to pay a bit more when the property moves. Does this stop any interest in multiple uh, unit housing? Because once you have it, you would, you know, these, these are in the 10 to $12 million, whatever we would assess them at. Once you have it, 
you're never going to be able to sell it to somebody else. So does it make it of less interest to build that kind of unit, multi-unit, multi-tenant housing in Amherst? Not that we have a lot of land left to build it on, but potentially. So that's one question. Um, do you, you know, the who's exempt, Mandy? I think that's an important category. Um, so what, how would you treat farms, um, you know, on the list? And we don't have Texas kind of farms. We just have little farms. How would you treat, um, I could go through a list. Um, churches don't sell themselves very often, but, you know, pretty low income. So I, I have a, does it halt the um, liquidity of the housing market to be able to move? Um, on the positive side, does flipping houses become more expensive? So you're less likely to see flips. Um, uh, you know, you, you're you encouraging longer term residents, you know, that if you're going to live in the house, if you're going to buy into Amherst, you're here to stay. So I have a kind of what's the dynamic and do we, is there a way of knowing that, not just speculating, have we seen places that have done this with a before and after? So I will stop there um, because my biggest concern on these kinds of things is you can't really calibrate them by the, it's not like an income tax where we can just target it for the highest income folks, um, but it could have some unintended consequences. I'm stopping. Um, I will try to answer some of that. Um, there may be unintended consequences. Um, you know, you don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to work until um, it's instituted. But um, the beauty of keeping the special act general and mostly relying on a bylaw is that the bylaw can then address some of those unintended consequences rather than if we had proposed a special act that had everything in it. Because then you'd have to go back to the legislature to do it. And so, you know, if for some reason we see that, you know, if, if you know, if in the bylaw we had a lot of exemptions, right? As, as Anna explained, we intended this, the bylaw intends to only have it apply to certain transfers. Um, and so if we found that, that that bylaw didn't exempt X property transfer and that was really halting those transfers and we were hearing that um, or, or doing harm with those transfers, then we could add that as an exemption to the bylaw. Um, and so, you know, for example, right now, the special act says all real property interest transfers, you know, at, but we have said we intend it to be residential property interest transfers, I believe. Um, and so, you know, those are things you can look at. Um, owner occupied to owner occupied, we'd be exempting. That's not in the transfer, the, the special act, because we want to be able to have that flexibility. So a farm that gets sold to another farm for owner occupancy or we could work that that exemption, you know, what does owner occupancy mean, right, um, into that bylaw. Um, one of the hopes is that it would make more expensive um, non-owner occupied transfers, especially at the low end of the scale, which may or may not um, disincentivize uh, investors from investing in Amherst. We don't know whether it will, but if it doesn't, the fee would then add at least some money to um, counteract some of the issues that those types of ownership transfers provide or present in town, right? As we all know, we can only tax them at the residential rate. We cannot tax them at the business rate um, on that sense, but we know certain types of occupancy provide certain issues in town. Um, and not all of those occupancies do. And this is a way to garner some fees in order to help alleviate some of those costs of those certain types of transfers. 
It's also going to be really important as we have this discussion to differentiate between the content that's in the bylaw and the content that's in the, the special act. Um, so all of those exemptions are bylaw exemptions that we would we would actually draft, right? The Mandy um, Mandy and I in the in the packet have that sample bylaw, but that's really a sample. We have not pitched any bylaw yet, and so uh, I I just I want to and I have a feeling we'll keep coming back to this, really look at the special act on the face of the special act because we're voting them separately. Um, and we will have to go through the entire bylaw writing process. Um, but we didn't wanna do that if the special act wasn't gonna get through. So that was that's the reason for the, the phasing of this. Yeah, I recognize Bernie. First off, uh, uh, thank you for what's a really good idea and some creative work. Um, one of the few I've seen in my gazillion years here in town. I appreciate it. Um, I think you're gonna wanna spend some time on the bylaw. Uh, I think some of the, the questions and concerns that have been raised are gonna be raised in the legislature and you're certainly gonna have opposition to this. So you may find that you're, uh, you're, you're changing the actual legislation more than you, you presume, and it's a tough fall to get um, a special act through the legislature, uh, especially one that involves money because the legislature tends to be very productive of, or protective of their ability to raise revenue. Uh, my question is around transfers between family members. Um, that um, uh, would, would that, uh, it says as may be defined by bylaws. So the transfers between family members is we're looking primarily at rental properties, uh, the 50% or so of the single family houses in town that are rental properties. Um, I, I don't see a reason why uh, uh, Uncle Joe, who's gonna transfer um, a house to, um, uh, unless it's at no cost to, to nephew Billy, um, shouldn't pay the 2%. Uh, so is that something that, again, could be contemplated in the bylaw or is a transfer between family members? Um, do you want to specify in terms of transfer between family members as gifts as opposed to sales? Um, might be a, a, another way of putting it. Yeah, that is something that would be kind of sussed out in the bylaw. And that has, you know, we, we did a lot of research on other towns that have this. And I will just say no other town has eliminated the family, um, the, the, uh, sale to a family member exemption. Um, that is something that is present as an exemption in every other town. That doesn't mean we couldn't do it differently, but um, it may make it challenging in mm -hmm. some ways, but okay. that would be an exemption in the bylaw. Well, our, our concern here is more the speculators and the, the folks who come in, buy a house, set up an LLC, and then flip it. Um, yes, but unless they're claiming a homestead, they right. pay this fee. So the first person, so Uncle Joe, in your example, if he's buying it and then selling it to a, for giving it to a family member for a dollar or whatever it might be, um, you know, that first time, unless Uncle Joe is living in the house, that fee would be expected to be paid okay. um, because you can only claim one homestead. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have some serious concerns about this whole idea. Um, and I'm sorry to take a contrary attitude, but first of all, um, when I look at the list of properties that would be subject to this fee, although fee and a tax are the same thing in, my, in, in reality, um, I would think that everyone, nearly all, if not all of these properties are already subject to the CTA surtax. So we're already taxing these properties for the same purposes that you want to add a fee onto. Um, and, and so I don't understand what the purpose of double taxation is. Um, secondly, I don't think this addresses the issue of investors buying owner-occupied properties and converting them into rentals. It won't stop that. It won't stop people from doing that. Um, it, it really just, it, it's silent on that. Um, the third thing is for if if there are if, it, if there's an investor that owns a property a rental property and you put any fees on that investor that landlord 
they're going to pass those fees on to the renters. They're not going to pay them out of their pocket. So if you're trying to make housing more affordable, you're, what you're doing is actually raising rents on people that are having a hard time meeting the rents. So you're not really making affordable housing. You're making less affordable housing. And then not every $800,000 house or $700,000 house is owned by someone of high income. Uh, it could be that someone bought a property and invested in it, added a lot of um, improvements to the house, and now it, it gets up into the range where it's subject to this fee. Um, you're punishing people for increasing the um, assessed value of the house, which is already being taxed by the town. Um, also, think about someone who purchases an owner-occupied house for, say, $800,000, and then the market crashes. They have to leave town. They have to sell the house at seven hundred fifty dollars or $700,000. they have taken a capital loss, but they have to pay the fee going in, and they have to pay the fee going out. So you're, 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 you're punishing people for market you know, circumstances beyond their control. Um, I, I just think there's going to be all sorts of issues like this, and I really think you should reconsider uh, this whole idea. I don't know. There wasn't really a question in that, Andy, so I'm not sure if you'd like Mandy and I to respond. Yeah. I mean, you, I guess. I, I would like to respond to, to the CPA issue. Um, sure. Um, because yes, all properties are subject to that CPA surtax, but CPA, as we all know, is only usable um, for four areas, one of which is affordable housing and actually requires that 10% of any CPA uh, raised in any year be used for um, recreation and another 10% be used for historic preservation. So it's not all dedicated to affordable housing, the CPA tax, um, the CPA surcharge. And our transfer fee uh, special act actually says there are other costs to providing affordable housing beyond just the building of affordable housing or the provision of it that the trust deals with, which is why we're sending some to the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund and the General Fund also places that CPA surcharge can't go. So I, I don't see that as um, whether you consider this fee a fee or a tax as double taxing for housing purposes. I'll add, you know, I think to the other points that were raised, I we might just have a fundamental ethical disagreement and that's okay, right? I think that for me, if someone buys a house and fixes it up to the point where it's now worth $800,000 and they're selling it for that, then yes, they should be subjected to this fee. I, that's just personally what I believe. And that's part of why I wrote this legislation, co-wrote this legislation with Mandy. Um, and I, I think that, you know, people are going to do the math. If they are, if they, if the market drops, they bought this, they pay the fee and then they have to, they have to move and sell it for whatever reason. Um, you know, I think they'll they'll do the math on pricing their house, knowing that this fee is in play, and and that's their prerogative and their um, their ability. I also, you know, I think that the the difference in terms of passing on to renters should, if this were um, a, a tax in my mind that were uh, occurring every year, which it is not, it is a one time fee. Then yes, I would have those same concerns. However, when people are paying a one time fee on an investment property. Um, I, I don't think that it's going to impact the rents as much as something that would be a regular, um, a regular tax, an annual tax. Um, there are surely other things, maybe there are, maybe there are not other things that can be done to address the issue that we seem to be having in Amherst about properties being purchased by folks flipping them into rentals. This is one way for the town to, um, to benefit from that trend it's not necessarily going to stop it in its tracks, right? Um, but it incentivizes folks, or it de-incentivizes folks a bit and um, supports folks buying those homes that are perfect for rental properties and are not 200% of the average um, assessed price in town. Michelle? 
Thank you. I'm a little scattered because I was I picked up Alex and came back in the middle of this whole meeting. So bear with me here. Um, so I really, really like the structure of this in terms of having the legislation on its own and then the bylaw having flexibility where it can be amended. Um, one of the questions I have, or just, I guess, to put out as a consideration is in terms of the split, it sounded like, I think I heard Mandy say, and I think I heard or read in the memo that you have to choose how the how the fee money that you collect will be used um, in the legislation. And that's sort of the part that you can't um, amend at a later time. So given the feedback that we've received around the need to increase affordable home ownership opportunities, um, and given the fact that we are potentially limited on the amount of affordable housing we can create, I might just think through a little bit more how we can reach that goal of home ownership possibilities in terms of the split. Um, and I'm not I'm not sure how that would work if it's a, if it's a, another type of stabilization fund or if it's um, something else or if it could come out of the one that you already are currently proposing. But just to think about that split. Um, the other piece, uh, a question about the Homestead Declaration. Um, my memory of the Homestead Declaration is it's something that you have to sort of, most lawyers will just do it, right? It's not something you necessarily have to ask for it to be done, but I just would, uh, is that sort of the indicator that it's an owner occupied? And, and if that isn't claimed for some reason, how do we um, look at that? And then Lastly, I, I have a similar concern to Bob. Um, I looked, uh, you know, sort of at other communities that are doing this. And I really honestly think this is a just a potential home run for our community. Um, but the unintended consequences uh, in terms of like we've heard with the rental registration fees, where those are going to get passed on to the tenant. Um, and that is something that we sort of hear reoccurring. And so my concern here is we have a lot of um, non-owner occupied rentals in this community. And I don't feel as bad for the ones that are like out of towners, but the ones that actually are part of our community. Um, my concern, and, and I feel bad, I mean, as, as Bob indicated, I think it's the renter that's going to end up really paying the price. And so is that um, inadvertently creating an unintended consequence. So I think, oh, and then just one final thought is um, with home rule petitions, um, we can do local approval by having a vote of the town council or by going out to the town and having a townwide vote. I'm not suggesting that we should have a townwide vote to get local approval here, but I am wondering what you've thought in terms of receiving public input on this prior to um, uh, potentially filing it. So there's my, <laughs> that's all I got right now. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to cut off the time in a few minutes on it. Do you have responses? I have a quick one just to the to the one of them that I have the answer ready to go for, um, which is the home ownership element. Um, I hear you and it's something Mandy and I are meeting with the affordable housing trust on Thursday, but ultimately it's their decision. So it the money goes to the trust and how they choose to allocate it is up to them. So um, we have made clear that we are hoping that they will start to consider using some funding for something like down payment assistant grants or things like that. But ultimately it's, um, they are the body that is responsible for promoting and protecting affordable housing in Amherst. And so we um, we don't want to overstep them by dictating how the funds can be used. And we can't overstep them. It's legally their, their right. So if I could just respond, no, that wasn't my suggestion. I totally understand oh, okay. that piece. My suggestion was more along the lines of, is that the split you want? So oh, do you I see, I see, I want see. that much to go to the authority? Yeah, that was, I yeah, totally I hear you. And yeah, and we're open to that. That's the other thing we're going to talk about with them on Thursday. We're open to that number being adjusted. Um, again, I, I mentioned at the beginning, 250 was just pulled kind of from 
sort of looking at their CPA requests over the years and, and taking half of it basically. Um, and so that was the yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So the other thing I would add is we were very cognizant that the AMAHT, the trust has limits on what it can use its money for in, especially as to affordable up to certain AMIs only for big A affordable um, and all of that. And so one of our thoughts in throwing to a general fund is that that would then allow some of this other money to potentially be used for that little a affordable, those higher sort of moderate income needs that we know are there through different types of contracting provisions, potentially. Um, and, and that's why by bylaw, so it could say allocated to the general fund to be used for X, Y, or Z too. It doesn't have to be just the general fund that would show up in a bylaw, but that was also a reason that it might look a little lower than you'd like for the trust, but we were cognizant that in our market, you might need to use those funds to get affordable housing at levels the trust can't actually use those funds for. Okay, um, Kathy? Okay, I, I, I also feel like we should be ending this. So I'm gonna try to, now that this has come back around from my first having the hooray, reaction, as you remember when you proposed it. Um, I've heard from a few people, so I want to formulate some of the questions and even the helping people buy. I just saw the CPA document on uh, allocations they provided and the, months, the funds unspent. And one of them that is, seems to be completely unspent is first-time home buyers. This is not that easy to do in our market. Uh, you know, even if you want big A or little A, M Mandy. Um, so I, uh, the general comment is this is starts to get packaged and I want to get into Bob's comments on, because he was addressing the unintended consequences. I'm worried maybe this boomerangs on us. I want to think that through, but I wouldn't over promise on, on what this can do um, on the housing side. I think if it generates money, we have plenty of uses for the money, but I wouldn't want to overpromise that suddenly, you know, uh, $800,000, $600,000, $400,000 houses somehow are for, because we can't really administer things the way wayfarers or or some of these others can. So, so that would be the caution just on the why this is a good idea, you know, to, to leave those purposes the way you did. So, uh, so how do we, do we, if I formulate questions, and I'd love a list of the towns that have done this, you probably already got this in your memo, and whether um, I can see, yeah, see whether um, any of them have had it in place for a decade, for example. Um, and if you've got that, just if you can link me to it, that would be great. Because I'd, I'd like to know how it has worked when, once they put it in the marketplace. And Bob's Pete, the last piece is Bob's, we are unusual because so much of our houses is our rentals. So it may have been less disruptive to renters in communities that mainly had home ownership, um, as opposed to what we've got, where we've got a lot of people. So just getting some links to other things I can either read and I will send you my questions. Happy to do that, Kathy. Really briefly, most of the, many of the places that have done this have extremely high rental populations as well, which is why they've done it. Okay, thanks. Cambridge and, and yeah. Yeah, Sean and then I have a few questions then we're gonna close it. This is really quick and I apologize if it's already in the um, in the document. If there If there are any purposes for the funds that would stay with the town, that are sort of borderline, whether the town can currently legally do it, you know, anything that would potentially fall in the anti aid amendment um, world, then you might want to explicitly um, include them in the, the special legislation so they're approved and authorized on the front end. Um, again, I'm not sure what those purposes might be, but again, if there's anything you're thinking would come out of the capital stabilization fund as opposed to the housing trust, um, you might want to just list them in the special legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had a series of questions. Kathy's asked one of them, which is uh, other towns that have done that. And it's obviously, um, I'm looking for Massachusetts communities uh, in, uh, that have, have done this. 
and uh, if you have that list and how long I did not see it in the memo because you go into fair detail, including a listing of property sales that occurred and I appreciated all of that. Uh, so that was one thing that I would be looking for. Um, just a couple of other things. We did get a fairly comprehensive email from actually two from an attorney who practices elder law and has been in mass in Amherst for a long time. And I know he's been in Amherst for a long time because when I was appointed to the original finance committee, I filled the vacancy that was created by his departure from the finance committee. And that was uh, probably 15, 20 years ago. So, uh, but in any event, um, uh, he raised a number of questions that I don't know if you recall his email, it wasn't to the entire council, but uh, uh, amongst other things, um, he was pointing out um, elders who have, um, you know, the house is their asset. They've been sitting on it for a long period of time. It's gained value simply because um, of the length of time that they've owned it. And now they're going to have to pay a transfer fee to dispose of it at a time when um, it's their only asset and they're trying to sell it for their estate planning purposes and the fairness of doing that. Um, there were uh, questions about um, whether it would it, um, encourage rental properties to become LLCs more readily because then you could sell the LLC and avoid the transfer tax because you're not transferring the property. The property stays in the ownership of the LLC and you're selling the LLC. And uh, so there are those kinds of issues about avoidance. Uh, and uh, for just for the record, he also made the point that it is a tax because the difference between a tax and a fee, according to his characterization, was that a fee is if you are providing a service, like we talked about earlier, um, charging a fee for um, being able to dispose, to have your sewer hooked up to the town sewer system, that you're getting something of value for it, uh, whereas a tax is something that's being charged that is being used for the general good as defined by the government and is not for the benefit of the person who's paying the amount of money. And um, I think that is uh, what the difference is. I think that he's right on that, that that's the difference between a fee and a tax under standard parlance. And uh, so it really does amount to a tax if you apply that kind of thinking to it. So those were some of the comments he had requested that uh, when it's assigned to a committee that we contact him and allow him to come in and speak to the committee. And uh, I probably do have to notify him uh, but, uh, that we've begun to take it up. I have not done so because this sort of came up in a hurry and I knew there was gonna be limited time today. So those were just some additional thoughts that, you know, came out of reading his email and just generally, because uh, uh, I was, uh, but because uh, I had started out with the first one, which was Kathy's question. I think so, it's important to notify all members of the public to contribute on this issue as well. I don't, I mean, I think, yeah, we received- yes, I agree. Ago, but yes. Um, he just made a request. That was the only reason that it came up. Yeah, I, I want to respond to the LLC issue because in section one of our proposed special act, we try to address that concern of just LLC. The property doesn't transfer the ownership of the LLC does, but it's still the same LLC. And so um, transferring a controlling interest in a trust LLC or other entity that directly or indirectly holds an interest in any class of residential real property situated in Amherst is also would also be subject to the tax. So that's how we've tried to address the LLC concern. Um, you know, it might need different wording to ensure that 
it does address that concern with his his indication of shares and stuff, but we we are aware of that issue and have attempted to make sure that those types of transfers would not would be subject to this fee would not be able to skirt it by doing what has been indicated. Okay, no, thank you. That. Um... Yeah, you know, when we get the list of other communities and look at other special acts and see whether there's similar provisions, if any time you take a, uh, a special act of this type and you're adding something that's new that the legislature has not dealt with before, it's going to um, immediately tweak a higher level of uh, scrutiny. and. Uh, we all know from uh, ranked choice voting that getting special acts through the legislature is never an easy or certain process. Uh, so, uh, which is why I think that uh, uh, we really need to work with you if we're going to do this to get something back to the council so the council can get the request. To Mindy, and I think that uh, which gets us to the last item. You don't have to leave because uh, I'm going to be real quick about this. Uh, we have several members of the committee who I actually do have to today. leave. So thank you so much. Okay, okay. if you've got to go, that's fine. Uh, we do need to uh, uh, schedule the next meeting, and um, it needs to fit in with when we can finish out the guidelines and. Uh, it needs to also uh, recognize the um, timelines of this particular um, matter. And uh, I don't want to try and set the date with so many people um, who are not here. So I'll uh, work with Athena or just directly send out some uh, a poll to um, come up with dates trying to stick with consistent times where we have met and, uh, based upon uh, experience with some of Athena's prior polls. Uh, and uh, we I want to tie that to several things. Uh, Lynn's uh, conversation that she's going to have with our legislators about filing deadlines and when we would need to act on this, if we're going to act on it for the next legislative session and uh, when we intend to uh, get the guidelines back to the council and set the deadline date uh, for council comments to the committee so that they come in advance of our next meeting. Uh, and, I, uh, and I guess my last suggestion would be uh, that uh, maybe working with Kathy, uh, since uh, one of us taking the lead, so we're not acting as a subcommittee, uh, but one commenting on the other's work to try and do a first draft of changes to address these issues so that we have a real working um, piece that we can do at the next meeting. And uh, Andy, are you talking about guidelines now? That's guidelines. Uh, so, is, uh, so I think that's what I would suggest as far as steps forward. I don't know if there are any comments. Uh, I was just trying to be quick about it and proposing a plan. Um, just a quick, what Lynn just did makes it extremely easy to do some quick inserts, you know, once we see whether there are a bunch of other comments that we're getting from counselors. So are you going to send set a deadline that anyone has to send? So Cam, Cam Rooney sent, but anyone who has any comments on the existing things, get them to us by today is Tuesday, by Friday afternoon, so that we could then do a, a marked up version. Uh I, that is the intention to set a deadline, okay. absolutely. And, uh, you know, it ties to our meeting date and our meeting date will tie in in the end to what Lynn and Anna's chair and vice chair advised us uh, is a date we should be getting this back to the council. <clears throat> we had an original plan 
this is not like the uh, legislature's deadline. There's a little bit more flexibility in it than uh, the legislature's going to give us. So anything else? Lynn? I, I'm just going to suggest that we quickly ask people whether we could meet next Tuesday and then we at least know whether we have any option with this group for next Tuesday at three? Well, we can ask that question of the people who are here. We have so many people who- No, there's, there's nobody missing from the committee, Andy. Uh, so Matt, I guess. Well, I'm just Matt. Matt. True. I mean, I think that helps set a date so that Friday close of business and I just, I'm ready to send it off, but I need to know is, are the comments coming back to Kathy or to you, Andy? Um, let's just have, let me see. Um, can everybody um, indicate can... either by raising their hand or using the raised hand function as to whether they could do next Tuesday? So, uh, and Sean said, okay, with you, if we did that. Yep. Yep. And uh, Bernie? Yep, that's fine. He had his hand I, up. Okay, now his hand's up. So, uh, okay, um, why don't I just send something to Matt, let him know what was going on. I'll do that tonight. Uh, but I think we'll probably go with Tuesday nonetheless and uh, three o'clock. And uh, so go ahead and make it Friday as far as the deadline date. And uh, uh, I'll leave it to Kathy to make the decision as to whether you want to come to you or to me. Well, it, you know, I saw Pam send them to you with a copy to me, which is a really efficient way. So it's in, you know, just it's CC to me. So if you tell people the deadline is end of the day, Friday the 9th, um, and then you and I can just talk after this. If you want me to take a shot at what Lynn has already done, once these others come in, I'm happy to. I can do it over the weekend. Okay. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that because uh, I was wondering if it might be good after I've uh, spent so many hours on this, if you you giving a fresh look at the uh, guidelines this time around, as opposed to me, if it might be good. Uh, Michelle? I just really want to thank you, Andy, for all the work that you've put into this and, and everybody who's contributed. It's it's a really um, um, it's an incredible document. And I just, I appreciate the time that you've spent on it and the thought that you've given to it. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Alicia? Sorry, I did very quickly want to echo uh, Michelle's um, comment. Thank you, Andy, so much for all of the work you did on this document. It's really great. Well, thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll all work together and get it through and uh, uh, have a real... Uh, and so, Kathy, if you change your mind, let me know. But otherwise, we'll uh, switch roles this time. But. Uh, because we don't want to be a subcommittee, somebody has to be taking responsibility for the draft and can consult, but it has to be the responsible party. I, I um, just sent out the email with my document attached to, oh, I, I need to send it to the finance committee people too. Sorry, I'll do that. Okay, so with that, um, anything else that people want to raise uh, is not unanticipated. Otherwise, I'm going to declare it as adjourned. All right, then I think we are adjourned. Bye, everyone. And, uh, it's a uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.